Take it away. All righty. Uh, well, we've gotten a nice introduction, and what I'm going to start talking about today is just how do baby animals survive? Uh, and it's not as easy as you think it might be. Uh, so let's let's explore this. First of all, baby animals, especially birds right now, because they're coming out and being fledged right now in this cold spring weather, face all sorts of dangers. If they get wet, and you can see what happened to this poor cardinal, if they get wet, they can't stay warm. So they get cold and they die. If the sun comes out and it's too hot and there isn't enough shade for the babies or they're in a nesting box that you've put out that doesn't have enough air holes in it, they get too hot and they cook, they actually die. And then they have to be fed. They need all sorts of food. For baby birds, it's usually caterpillars. Uh, for other baby animals, it might be seeds. And for baby mammals, it's usually milk. So we're gonna to talk today about four different kinds of babies. We'll spend most of our time on birds, but we'll go through a couple of insect babies so you see the different strategies they have for surviving, and a few amphibian babies. Those will be the frogs and the, and the toads. And then we'll end with just a few mammals, the kinds that you'd see in your backyard, uh, squirrels, chipmunks, foxes, animals like that. So let's talk about our birds. There are really two kinds of birds that you're going to encounter either in your backyard or in the, in the parks around you. And those are the ones that are born helpless, like our songbirds and our raptors. They're called altricial birds. Uh, and the other ones are called precocial. Those are the ones that are born ready to go right out of the egg. So your songbirds and your raptors are, are born virtually blind and helpless no feathers, they can't keep themselves warm, they can't regulate their own body temperature, they can't feed themselves. Whereas your baby ducks, your waterfowl, your turkeys, uh, those shorebirds are born with their eyes wide open, they have down, they're ready to go, and many of them actually leave the nest in a day or two. Uh, now, the reason that they're able to leave the nest in a day or two is because they have a much longer incubation period, a bigger yolk longer incubation period allows them to get ready uh, so that they are born with those little downy feathers. Whereas your songbirds have that shorter incubation period and really need to be taken care of. Now, even though they need to be taken care of, those songbirds are fast. This is a robin nest that was filmed by a friend of mine out of his uh, dining room window into his holly bush. And you can see that on day one, he's got those eggs there, beautiful robin blue eggs. You can see the very helpless uh, young, and that's day six. They're helpless, but they're also very hungry. You see their bulging eyes that are still haven't even opened. Uh, but by day six, uh, and, and they have these big gaping maws, as you can see, and that's a target that uh, this, this orange area here is, is seriously a target uh, for mama to stuff uh, caterpillars into. By day 10, they're sleeping, they're getting a lot of their little pin feathers, they're still hungry, they're still eating. And by day 15, two weeks, two and a half weeks at most, they're fledged and ready to go. Now, very different story for our larger birds like our raptors. This is a great horned owl, and from egg to flight for this bird is two and a half months much, much longer time period, uh, a lot longer incubation period. And so they're starting in January and February when they're getting their nests ready, laying their eggs, and then incubating them. Now, how do you make those eggs? Well, you've got to have a mate, a mama and a papa. And different birds have different mating strategies. The red-winged blackbird in the center there and the little house wren with his tail up in the air are polygamous. They'll have many mates. So they'll have many, many nests uh, with females tending eggs on them. The bluebirds in the lower left are monogamous. They supposedly mate for life. Uh, they've done some DNA testing and they find out that bluebirds are just like human beings and they're not always faithful. Uh, but the phalarope up there in the upper left hand corner is the opposite of the wren she has many husbands. So it 
it's uh, a lot of strategies for a lot of different kinds of birds. Now, the variety of eggs themselves is also endless. Each egg takes about a day to lay, and they will vary in size from that very tiny, tiny house wren uh, to a robin, which is about uh, well, maybe an inch long. Uh, you can see them in comparison to a uh, dime there. Uh, and these are the smaller songbird eggs. If you look at this egg on the inside, it's much like a chicken egg. It has a yolk, it has an albumum, and it has a shell. But what I want to call your attention to is the fact that the shell actually has pores, because this animal has to breathe. So air gets in through that shell. And you'll see that there's up at the top of that egg, a little air cell. That air cell gets larger and larger and larger as the egg develops. And the egg will uh, float if it's too old. So if you have a, your chicken eggs in the, in the uh, refrigerator and you want to find out whether the egg is old or not or fresh or not, if it floats, it's not very fresh. If it sinks, it's fresh because it doesn't have as much air in it. So that air gets diffused in through the uh, membranes, that inner membrane and the outer membrane, and goes into the albumin and the yolk. Now, the interesting thing about the yolk is actually where the animal is. The albumin, that white stuff that's on your chicken egg, that has hundreds of different antimicrobial agents in it that keeps the egg healthy. So your egg is a really special kind of, uh, a very special kind of single-celled animal that develops into this thousands of cells and becomes a baby bird. It takes about 24 hours to create that egg and the calcium comes primarily from mama's bones. So mama will be laying that egg all night and it starts up in her ovary, comes down this uh, the whole tube where the fertilization has taken place and first the albumin gets coated around the yolk, and then the membranes start to get added, right about here in the middle, the membranes start to get added. And when it gets down to what's called the actual uterus, that's where there's a special shell gland. And that shell gland right here is, let's see if I can get this to, here we go, shell gland right here squirts the, the, the shell covering on and then adds pigment and then the egg is laid. So the pigment and the shell come absolutely last, but it takes 24 hours to do this. So that means one egg at a time. Now the color, strangely enough, comes from only two different pigments, a uh, 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 protoforphan, and a Billy Verdon. One is reddish brown, one is, is blue. And it's the mixture of those colors or the lack of those pigments that give you the infinite variety that you see on these eggs. Uh, I'm gonna go back there for a second because I, I'm telling you it takes a day to lay an egg. That means that mama is gonna have, if mama has a clutch of four or five eggs, it's gonna be four or five days before all of those eggs are laid. And if you're a songbird, uh, you aren't going to start to incubate those eggs until you've laid all of them. So you incubate them after you've laid your four or five or seven eggs, depending on how many you've got. Uh, you start incubating them. And that means you're incubating them all at the same time and they'll all hatch at the same time. That great horned owl or uh, the raptors, are a little bit different. They lay their one egg and they begin incubating it immediately. So their babies will hatch at different times and you'll have a larger nestling in the uh, nest with a smaller nestling. And that usually does not bode well for the smaller nestling. Now there's one other thing about eggs. These muir eggs are all from the same species of common muir. But look at the different colors. Some of them have virtually no spots. 
Some of them have straggly spots. Some of them are brownish. Some of them are blackish. And that's all because mama's got to know her egg from other eggs. They're laid primarily on the ground. And if she can't find her own egg, she'll be incubating the wrong egg. And you'll also notice that the egg shape is different. It's got a very pointy end. And that's so if the egg starts to roll, it'll roll in a circle and it won't roll off the cliff where the mirrors are laying their eggs. So why lay an egg in a nest? Well, first of all, animals don't usually use their nests except at birthing time. So we're, we're humans, we have a house, we live in our house all year round. If, and long time ago, we used to have our babies at home. Uh, if we have our babies, we just go into one of the bedrooms and we have our babies, right? But a bird doesn't use a nest except in the spring, there are a few, with a few exceptions. Uh, and it's primarily a way for the animal to raise its babies, to, to lay its eggs, incubate them, and move on. Usually, songbird nests are never used again. And this is probably because of parasites. Uh, there are some birds that will use them, and we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Now, here are some of those exceptions. <laughs> that Baltimore Oriole may reuse its nest, and that's a very complex nest. You can see the woven nest there. The cliff swallows always reuse their nests. They nest in colonies, and they'll come back and reuse their nests. The house wren will start five or six different nests and wait for his females to come and finish them. Because remember, this, this guy has multiple females. The wood duck in the lower left will lay up to 15 eggs in her nest box, but another female may come in and dump her eggs in there too. So you've been known to have up to 30, 35 eggs in one wood duck box, uh, not all belonging to the same wood duck, uh, and sometimes with two mothers in there incubating together. The great horned owls don't even build their own nests. They scavenge the nests of red-tailed hawks and crows and ravens, sometimes even old squirrel nests. Now, the most interesting, I think, of all of these animals on this particular page is that red-headed woodpecker, because that bird will build several nests one for its babies, one to store its food, and one where it can get in and sleep out of the wind. So why spring? All songbirds, with one exception, feed their babies caterpillar. And caterpillars are there in spring. It's a real great source of protein. And protein is what's necessary to grow those baby birds. And those baby birds, in a, in a week or two, will double their weight. So they need that protein. Uh, and they've got to have time, if they're a raptor and they need to learn how to hunt, then they've got to have time to learn how to hunt uh, before winter comes. Now, the nest that you're seeing here is a house finch. And you'll notice that the male is feeding the female on the nest. He may not only feed his female while she's laying her babies, he may feed the young after she goes and lays a second or even third clutch. That's why we have so many house finches all around. But what this means is if you want to have birds in your yard, you have to cultivate insects. You have to invite caterpillars into your yard. Otherwise, you will not have birds. Now, one of the problems we have with nests is, of course, you've got to keep them clean. And the most amazing thing, I think, is that baby birds have a particular instinct when they're fed, when mama stuffs that caterpillar down their mouth. They immediately swallow the caterpillar, turn around, and poop out this thing called a fecal sac. It's like built-in diapers. It is the coolest thing. You know, it's, it's really nice. So all mama has to do, like this bluebird is doing, is pick it up and throw it out of the nest. She's flying off with it. You can see how small it is. It's smaller than a, than a quarter in this person's hand. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner a fecal sac that I found on the ground and <laughs> was keeping for many years in my freezer until it got really grody. Uh, you'll see that it's about an inch long, and it just looks like uh, 
a piece of white tissue paper, actually, but it's a little wet. So that's how they keep their nests clean. Now, you'll notice that a songbird's beak isn't hooked and it isn't particularly uh, sharp. Uh, if you're a raptor, you don't get the ease of the fecal sac. So if you're an owl or an eagle or a hawk, you get your young to poop over the side of the nest. You also have a very messy nest, but they don't have the, the built-in diaper with the, the, the fecal sac, so to speak. Now there's one problem that babies and adults face, and that is the brown-headed cowbird. Cowbirds are nest parasites, which means they come along like the mafia and, and shake you down. Uh, they will lay their egg in another bird's nest. This is a warbler nest, and you can see the difference in size between the cowbird right here and the poor warbler right there. The warbler is not, it's not even half the size of the cowbird. And so the cowbird will outcompete that warbler nestling every time the mother comes back to feed it. And the warbler will eventually die and the cowbird will get fed. Some warblers have learned how to outsmart the cowbird. They will build another nest on top of the first nest. In fact, they've been known to build seven layers of nests on top of each other, trying to escape the cowbird that comes back and lays another egg. Sometimes the cowbird leaves them alone. Sometimes the cowbird will come and destroy the nests in a fit of pique. Uh, can't really ascribe uh, emotions to the bird, but it sure seems that way. So it's a, it's a bird that's a, a challenge to parents trying to raise infants. Now, the cuckoo is another nest parasite, and it comes equipped with a special set of little, right here you see them, little wedges on its shoulder blades, specially designed to remove somebody else's eggs from the nest that you get laid in. Really nasty little trick. The one bird that's fairly successful in outmaneuvering these brown-headed cowbirds is the goldfinch. And partly that's because the goldfinch nests a lot later in the season, July to September. And it's the one of the few birds that can actually raise its young on seeds. But of course, it's nesting late enough to have these juicy, uh, fatty seeds out of uh, sunflowers and thistles and other good seed heads. Let's take a look at a raptor compared to that songbird. And this is our resident great horned owl at Habitat Sanctuary. He's snoozing in the sun. We have a pair of owls that are, have been pretty successful. Every year they've had a, a, a nest full of owlets. In this case, it was two, two babies uh, in 2017. And they start nesting in January. They're hooting at each other in December and January, and they start nesting. And by February, they're incubating an egg. And that will lead to these, these little guys are about uh, six weeks old. They're nice and fledged with their, their fur. You can begin to see their little horns starting to take shape. Uh, those horns are not actually horns. They're just tufts of feathers that look like horns. That's why they're called the great horned owl. And while this is going on, the papa, and sometimes the mama, are hunting squirrels and various sundry other animals to feed to the owlets because they take a lot of food growing up. Now, we talked about the difficulty of being wet. And you can see what happens to an owl. They're about six, eight weeks now, probably eight, nine weeks, judging by the little ear tufts. When they get wet, they lose a lot of heat. Uh, he's got, this little owl has a, a lot of down there to still protect him, but you can see how his feathers disappear and how unhappy he looks being wet. When the owls are hatched and running around, uh, on the branches of their trees in their nest, 
Mama and Dada will be in the trees nearby, and it's going to be hard to see them. I want you to take a look at this and see if you can figure out where the owl is. I'll give you a while to take a look. Should be pretty easy to spot her. If you can't spot her, here she is. You've got her head right here and her wing feathers and tail feathers there. But they hang out and they watch for the babies. And the babies will sometimes fall out of the nests and land on the ground. They bounce because they've got all that wonderful fluffy down. But if you discover them as our uh, property manager, Sandy Borse did behind a brush pile, they will fluff up their wings and do what's called a threat display. So here you have this little baby owl trying to make himself look four and five times the size he is, trying to scare off Sandy. So Sandy put the brush pile back and let him go. But how does he get back up into the nest? He can't fly yet. It looks like he's got wings. He can take a couple of hops with those, but he can't fly all the way back up to that nest. So what's a baby bird to do? Well, he climbs. Now this is a barred owl, but it's the same thing for a great horned owl. So right here you have the nest and the bird has come all the way up here. It did that by flapping its wings. You see it flapping its wings right here and hooking its talons in and climbing. Flap, climb, flap, climb, flap, climb all the way up to the top of the tree. Now, uh, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Mary Holland at Naturally Curious. Curious. She sends out a weekly blog of nature photos and look her up on the web, web because she is just, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful blog and I highly recommend it to you. Now, blue jays are songbirds and they're not like raptors. They will, uh, they will be, uh, incubating and fledging their young in about four in about uh, two weeks, a little bit, two and a half weeks. But blue jays like to be secluded. So they'll look for something that's evergreen. This is a holly tree in my backyard. And you can see that if you couldn't see her eyeball right here, it'd be really hard to see this nest. But you can see that they're quite hungry. And this is uh, when mama is feeding them. Uh, this is at about three weeks. At about four weeks, five weeks, you have them over here on the right. They're fully fledged and ready to go. Those are the babies that had their mouths open there. Now, these parents have to defend these babies against a number of threats. They've got good cover here, so you've got lots of uh, shade so they're not going to get too hot. You've got cover so they're not going to get too wet. But you can't protect them from squirrels and squirrels will come up to the nest and eat the babies or eat the eggs. So these adults have to be very, very vigilant. And I watched them chasing squirrels all over my yard. They would chase those squirrels around trees forever. But the parents have to be very, very vigilant. Robins are not like blue jays. They don't care about seclusion. They will nest just about anywhere. For example, uh, Cornell runs a nest watch program that asks for the funniest nests people have ever seen. And this woman sent in this picture of the five different nests a robin had tried to build over her husband's two coal forges. So this robin is trying to build their nests right on top of a fire. This robin is in my front yard in Newton, and you can see the nest right here. That nest is being totally overrun by children five times a day because there's a schoolhouse one house away from this nest. And the stone wall right here is only about three feet high. So a child's head would be right about here. 
and it doesn't bother the robin at all. She built the nest there, she fed the babies, she brooded the babies, totally successful. Uh, even tried to do it a second year, but the second year the tree didn't leaf out enough fast enough. So we're going to look at a number of different nest types now. And we'll look at colonies. Uh, at, at the very end, we'll look at cups, platforms. There are birds that build log cabins. Those would be our wrens. The platforms are built by the ospreys and the eagles. Uh, the mud cups or gourds uh, can be built by certain kinds of swallows. And then we'll look at tree cavities. There are birds that actually burrow here, and there are birds that don't really build a nest at all. They just have a scrape on the ground. And you can see the list of things they use, uh, you know, sticks and bark and grasses and ribbons we might expect, but spider webs? <laughs> That's an interesting one. And sand and rocks? they build with everything. And they build everywhere. There are always exceptions. This is one of those Cornell pictures where they, uh, the, these are probably house sparrows right here, uh, have built a nest inside the lion's mouth in a local library. So let's look at the smallest nest you're ever likely to see. Uh, this is the ruby-throated hummingbird. It's the only hummingbird we have up here in Massachusetts. And the nest is slightly larger than a quarter. Usually there are only two eggs in that nest. And the nest is so unusual because it stretches. So you can see how small these little eggs are, right? But look at how big these fledglings are. The nest expands because it's made of spider silk. And spider silk is the stretchiest stuff you've ever seen in your life. What the bird does is it gathers the spider silk, puts its smack on top of a branch, stamps on it to make a platform, brings thistle down and all sorts of other plant down and lichen, and weaves the silk and all this thistle down into this very compact, very sturdy little nest. And then decorates the outside, as you can see here, with lichen, and that camouflages it. But this nest is so sturdy that if she isn't incubating it when it's raining, the nestlings can actually drown inside the nest. But once they do successfully fledge, and you can see they have successfully fledged here, uh, that nest will expand to hold them. Now here's one of my favorite nests, and it's, I have one that I can share with you at the end. We're going to try to show you a live nest. Uh, well, it's a dead nest, but <laughs> a, a real specimen. Uh, this is the Baltimore Oriole. The male is that incredibly beautifully colored orange and black. Female is a little duskier looking, and it's a hanging pouch. They build these nests at the very tips, and you can, this is an old one from a previous year. It's at the very tip of a branch. So I got my nest that I'll be showing you at the end of the program uh, because it blew down off of a tree. But these nests will sometimes be reused. The interesting thing is it looks like they're woven, but they're not. What the female does is she lays all sorts of strips of plant material on her branches, and then she starts to poke at it with her bill. She essentially felts the material. She, she uh, gets it tangled up. And once it starts to tangle, she lays more up uh, and she'll lay it up over the areas where she's attached it to, to places and start poking it there until she has a pretty solid mass. And then she'll start diving inside, straight in down and building a cup in the bottom. And that's how she builds that nest. When she's feeding her nestlings, all you see is her tail feathers sticking up out of the mouth of the, the nest. It looks like popsicle sticks. Uh, and that's where she is. It takes her almost two weeks to build that nest. Male doesn't do any helping at all. Now here's a really unusual nest I'll also be showing you at the end when we get rid of the slides. This is a warbler, uh, a warbling vireo. And they will use 
hairs, horse hairs, cow hairs, dog hairs, uh, to weave their little nest. There, it's a tiny cup, and they will de decorate it with all sorts of rootlets, uh, things like that, and that will keep their nestlings very safe. I wanted to show you this because it's uh, this black-throated green warbler, because they decorate their nest with white birch bark. It's a beautiful nest. Now here's a bird that you have a good chance of seeing because Eastern Phoebes uh, are one of the birds that do reuse their nest, but they also build their nests around your house. They may build them in your light boxes. They may build them in your hanging plants. They may build them on your roof rafters. Uh, they're very, very used to hanging around people. You'll hear their call. It's a sort of a Phoebe, Phoebe, sort of a high-pitched call. And they often decorate their nests with moss all the way around. They're very flat nests, a little cup, and they're quite beautiful. And they, again, like most songbirds, will take about two weeks uh, to hatch and fledge. Now here's a platform nesting bird. This is our morning dove. We have over 300 million morning doves, and they're actually hunted. Hunters take about 20, 000, 20 million, actually, a year. Doesn't even make a dent in the diet of these, these birds. They forage on the ground, uh, mostly seeds, but they build a very scraggly nest. And you can see the nests here. It just looks like a rat's nest. And they build it on a platform. Now, if they're forced to use a tree, they have been known to build such a, a, a flimsy nest that all of the eggs fall through the bottom, which doesn't work particularly well. Uh, but they, they are uh, a seed-eating bird, but they will be feeding their young as they're getting their young ready to go on caterpillars and insects. Let's look at precocial birds now, because we've been looking at all these altricial birds, uh, with, except for the, the uh, owl. Uh, and let's look at the Canada goose and the, and the turkey, because these are birds that are born ready to go out of the egg. You can see the Canada goose parents, the father and the mother, they're grazing on the grass, and the, the infants, the little goslings, are grazing too. Over here, where there's a pond, you'll see a little island. This is where they have their nest. And you can see the mother getting the babies underneath her while dad stands guard. She's got the last baby under there and she's fluffing her wings out to get them in underneath her. And then she's finally settled down. She's brooding them to keep them warm because it's a cold day. Now, she's got to keep them warm. And you might think that there's not gonna be any problems out there on that island because it's gonna be hard for say a raccoon or a coyote might eat her eggs or a snake uh, to get out there and do anything. Well, she has her own problems. And there's a very funny story about this. This goose has been building this down pile to keep her eggs nice and warm while she goes to take a swim. And up comes a set of red-eared sliders. Uh, I'm sorry, these are cooters. And they decided that this is a great place for basking. So they actually took over the nest. They're sitting there on the eggs, literally on top of her eggs. She can't get to her nest. And it's the funniest darn thing. My sister photographed this for me. And she said the, the, the goose was simply confounded. The goose would peck at the, at the turtle, the turtle would ignore the goose, but the do, goose didn't seem to have enough sense to take its bill and stick it under the turtle and flip the turtle off, or put its foot under the turtle and flip the turtle off. It just couldn't get a grip. <laughs> it did eventually get the turtles off. You can see the last two eggs in the nest, and you can see the little ones swimming with mom and dad in the pond. But these are, these are animals that are ready to go and ready to eat on the, the second day of, after hatching. Turkeys are the same way. Turkeys lay their nests in a scrape on the ground. They don't even build a nest, but you can see how this mother right here 
is so well camouflaged that she looks like she just blends in to the leaves. And that, in fact, helps her protect her babies. She is able to do that because of her coloration. And at Habitat, we had a turkey that was nesting this way that was only seven feet from a walkway where we had people who used to walk their dogs. They've got their dogs on leashes. And the dogs can smell something. They can't see the turkey. And they're straining and looking all around. And the people are looking all around. They can't see the turkey. That turkey will lay 14, 15 eggs. You can see them here uh, in this picture. And will incubate them for quite a long time. Because again, this is, this is a bird that's got to have babies ready to go. When they hatch, in a day or two, they are actually out following mom and pecking up their own food off the ground. This is later in the season. You can see mama over here. And you can see the holes that they're digging in the, in the, in the mulch as they're scavenging for acorns and uh, arthropods, little stuff in the, in, the, in the soil that they will be eating. But turkeys will be running along on the ground when they're, you know, less than a week old. And mom is going to have to protect them because they can't quite fly yet. But after a week, they're actually able to fly up to roost. So they're protected then. Now, here's our red-headed woodpecker and red-bellied woodpecker in this case. Uh, and you can see that they make cavities. They actually excavate these cavities. And you can see how they do that here. And then down in the bottom, they line it with these beautiful chips of wood. And that's where they'll have their babies. It's a great nest. And for most woodpeckers, it's used only once. And that's great because it leaves lots of leftover nests for the black-capped chickadees, the titmice, and other, and nuthatches, other cavity nesting birds. Now, these little chickadees are the smallest bird, but they're probably going to be the most common bird you'll see running in and out of your feeders and in your backyard. They're incredibly smart. In that little beady brain of theirs, they can store the location of 20,000 seeds that they wedge under little pieces of bark here and there and everywhere. Uh, and they'll remember which are the best and the fattest seeds, and they'll go get them. But in the spring, they're going to feed their babies caterpillars. And it may be 20 caterpillars a day, 20, for each baby. So if you don't have any caterpillars in your yard, you're not going to have any nesting birds. And you're probably not going to have any bird babies. Now, the funkiest nest that uh, the people at uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab ever heard about was a nest described by a couple in California. And I've made a cartoon here to show you what they discovered. They had cut down a huge eucalyptus tree and were busy cutting two-foot sections of it. And when they cut one two-foot section, they realized there was a hole in that two-foot section, and that hole had a nest in it. So then they were worried. So they put this log on top of the stump, and then they got worried, well, maybe it'll rain, and it'll, it'll, it'll be a downpour, and then the birds will get wet. So they attached an umbrella to the log. And the chickadee totally came back, fledged all its young, and everybody lived happily ever after. Now, another cavity nesting bird is the tufted titmouse. And this is a beautiful little bird that you'll see very commonly in your, in your backyard. But they'll be nesting in either old rotted parts of uh, branch holes or uh, woodpecker holes. Here's the bird that makes the log cabin. And you can see the sticks here. In a, in, a, in a log cabin, the bird will come in, down, and then in that way. Uh, the front of this nest box is off so that you can see it. The Carolina wren, this is the house wren here. 
The Carolina wren has been known to nest just about anywhere. Flower pots, mailboxes, propane tank covers, and in fact, people have found them nesting in their old garden coats that they've left on a hook in the pocket or in their old Wellington boots. So check your boots before you put them on. You might have a wren nest in there. Now there's a problem for our cavity nesting birds, uh, the chickadees and the uh, titmice uh, and so forth. And those are these alien birds. Uh, they're uh, invasive birds. They came from England. The house sparrows come from uh, England and the European starlings come from Europe. These animals will destroy the nests of other birds, bluebirds and, and animals like that, uh, and take over their nests. So uh, it's, it's another problem for, uh, for parents. Here's our one burrowing bird. It's a kingfisher. Uh, this is a predatory bird that feeds on fish. It has a very interesting call. It sounds like a cackle as it strafes ponds. And it will dig holes in the side of a stream bank. Those holes can go back 10 or 15 feet into the bank. And they lay their eggs in the back there. They don't make any kind of nice nest. They just lay them on the ground, incubate them, and bring food into the young that way. Eagles make our heaviest nests. This is a big platform nest. And eagles, if you ever get up to uh, the Newbury River area uh, and Newburyport, you'll see, we have a lot of bald eagles up there or Plum Island, you'll see them there. And the nests that these birds make and reuse year after year after year can weigh several tons they can get so big. So here you have a colony of great blue herons out on a river island and they are uh, just hanging out together. Now, there's an interesting thing about these colony birds. They, they're big birds. You're talking about a three or four foot tall bird sitting on that nest. And they don't start until fairly late in the season. Uh, so we're talking April when they're getting started. And it has been known that a great horned owl would take over, say, this nest long before the herons come back and raise its young in that nest while the herons are raising their young. So now we're going to move very quickly to show you how babies come to insects. And we have social insects and solitary insects. Barbara, can I ask you a question before you sure. move on? Sure. We have a question from Jennifer in the chat. She wants to know what kind of caterpillars do chickpeas eat? Okay, chickadees eat they need several different kinds of caterpillars too. So your chickadee is gonna want, let's get back to our chickadee here, whoops. Your chickadee is going to want uh, whatever caterpillars it can get, but it's gonna want several kinds. Uh, so tent caterpillars will be eaten by chickadees, uh, webworm caterpillars, just every caterpillar known to man will be stuffed down uh, that bird's craw. So it's hard for you to plant your yard to attract a particular kind of caterpillar. What you're really gonna want is to make sure you have oaks, maples, and cherries, native trees, not special ornamental trees, because they host the most caterpillars. Great, thank you, Barbara. Okay, Doc, let's... Scoot your head here. Okay, so paper wasps build these elaborate paper nests. They're colonial, and you can see how they do this. Uh, and they raise their babies there. They build the entire nest over again each year. At the end of the year, the nest is abandoned. And a single queen will overwinter and start all over again the next year. So the babies get tended and fed uh, inside the nest. So these get some pretty good care. The carpenter bee is a little bit different. The carpenter bee will put these holes in wood. It'll actually drill into wood 
and lay eggs that hatch out into these little grubs. And each of those grubs is provisioned with a ball of pollen that they can eat, and then they hatch. They come out uh, last in, first out. <laughs> uh, they come out in the reverse order that they went in. So there's no parental control or, or, or preparation or brooding at all. The they parent leaves food there for them, and then they're, they're on their own. They have their own enemies. Uh, parasitic wasps, the woodpeckers, of course. Uh, you can see how woodpeckers can excavate a, uh, a log. And skunks. Skunks will dig up nests of ground nesting bees and ground nesting wasps. So they're not entirely free. Let's move on to amphibians and look at what kind of parental care they get. It's zero. You're on your own. Uh, on the left here, you have these beautiful spirals of American toad eggs. And on your right at the top, you have these globs of eggs that are wood frogs that are just abandoned in the pond, and then they will hatch on their own and try to avoid predators. Now, if there are ducks in that pond, they will slurp these up and eat them. If there are leeches, they will eat them. Now, if you're a salamander, there, we have two different kinds of salamanders here. One, this uh, yellow spotted salamander, does not take care of its eggs. It leaves its eggs here in these beautiful jelly-like sacs and abandons them. The other, this little red back here, will lay eggs and she actually broods those and then they take off and they look like little red or, or lead colored worms with, with, uh, with feet. <laughs> They have their own problems. If their pond, if their vernal pool dries up too fast, and this is Habitat's vernal pool in 2012, uh, where these people are standing, the water is usually this deep, right? That, so they're, that, they would be underwater at this point. Uh, and what they're finding are half dead wood frog eggs and completely desiccated wood frog eggs. They look like little pieces of dried seaweed. And that year, we had no babies at all. Mammals provide the most care of all of the animals. And this is because most of their babies are born totally brined and, and helpless. And they have to be suckled and taught foraging skills and all sorts of things. The fastest of the mammals is the eastern cottontail. This is the little bunny you see in your, in your house. And they will nest just about anywhere. This planter that you see here with this piece of, uh, of raw earth here, that earth had that grass piled in it. And I got a call from my neighbor saying, Barbara, Barbara, I don't want to do this rabbit is digging up my potted plant. And I said, for goodness sake, just go out and shoo her away. Oh, I can't do that. So I had to go over and shoo the rabbit away and take the grass out. And the rabbit went someplace else. But the rabbits, will have their young, and within a week, those babies, as you can see here, uh, are ready to fend for themselves. So two weeks and they're on their own. Chipmunks a little bit different. Chipmunks, uh, like uh, the red-winged blackbird and the house wren, are polygamous. They'll have many mates. But they build these very elaborate burrows where they have nuts stored, where they have uh, lots of nuts stored where they have a nest, where they lay their young, where they have a latrine. Uh, they have latrines where they need to have latrines and they will have many various entrances. Uh, but they will take care of their young and suckle them until they're ready to go. And they may have two broods a year, but you won't see the little babies running around. They've already made it and they're, they're raising their babies underground. You won't see the babies until May or June. Gray squirrels will nest in cavities like this one here, and these things that we call drays that are big masses of leaves, but they're born totally helpless, as you can see this, hairless and helpless, and they're suckled just like other mammals, uh, 
They don't eat, they don't feed their babies nuts or anything like that uh, until the babies are old enough to go off on their own. These are the babies, you can see them right here at Habitat that we had. Uh, they're almost ready to go by the middle of April. Foxes are a different story. We have two kinds of foxes, gray foxes and red foxes. The gray foxes can climb trees. They have retractable claws. The red foxes do not. But the red foxes are more common where we are. We see the grays out in the Berkshires and up on uh, Cape Ann, on Gloucester. But here's Mary Holland showing us a fox den that's being excavated uh, in the middle of February. They're getting ready. She's cleaned out the, the den and is marking it. And you will see that she's got the babies way down there in the, the bottom, higher. If, so if you get water in here, the water will collect down there. They'll be higher than the water. And then she's got a storeroom where she can put the remains of prey, if she's got more prey. Uh, both mother and father will go after prey animals and bring back the dinner, but they're not home free. They have to defend the den. Mary Holland tells a very interesting story about a raccoon, and you can see the size of that raccoon and the size of that fox. A fox weighs about 10 pounds. Uh, it's a little bit longer legged than your cat, but a little bit bigger than your cat. They just have very long fur. That's why they look so big and fluffy. But this mother fox was trying to drive this raccoon away from her den, and the, the raccoon was trying to get in to eat her young. And the mother would run at the raccoon, and the raccoon would back up, and then the raccoon would run at the mother, and the mother would back up, and they had this standoff for about a uh, half an hour until the mother finally chased the raccoon off. Otherwise, foxes have a pretty carefree life once they're uh, fully able to go out and, uh, and roam around after they're eating solid food. You can see these foxes in front of my sister's house. They're drinking out of her bird bath, eating the seeds that are falling off of her uh, bird feeder as well. So your mammals are really going to take a lot of good care. What we're going to do now is I'm going to stop screen sharing and show you some actual nests. And we are going to go back to speaker view, and we've been talking about, okay, Robert, can we have me uh, on the main speaker screen? So uh, if, uh, so folks at this point want to be in speaker view as opposed to gallery view, uh, and you can change that in the top right corner of the screen, or not quite top right, but towards the top right, uh, you want to click on um, what says speaker view. Uh, it should say speaker view with sort of a, I'm not even sure what I would call that, like a, what do you call that thing in the movies where they, where they. Uh, oh, it's a little box with three dots on top. A little box with three dots. There you go. So you want to click on that and um, then we'll get a, a good uh, large uh, shot of Barbara here because Barbara's going to show us a few nests and things. First, I'm going to show you what happens to an egg when uh, we still have you as the main speaker on my screen, uh, Robert, and I'm not sure why. Uh, let me let me pull up. Um, let me see here. Barbara, um, Barbara Vallat, do you see Barbara Bates on your screen or me? No, I see me now. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think want to see me. <laughs> the person who's talking should be the person who shows up on the screen. So if yes, I stop I talking, then Barbara Bates should show up. I okay, let me story. try talking. Okay. I'm, I'm Barbara Bates and all I see is Barbara Villat on the screen. Can we mute Barbara Villat? Mm -hmm. 
she's muted. So Barbara, I, I think I'm, I'd say keep talking. Okay. Everyone, everyone sees so, you. So here is this egg. This, you can see the hole in this egg. That hole was created probably by a blue jay that ate this robin's egg. And you can see how the egg is pretty much intact otherwise. If a squirrel had eaten that egg, it would have been demolished. That robin's egg came from a nest that is quite amazing. It is lined with grass. It has a mud rim. You can see how firm that mud rim is. And it's quite large. The bird gets in there to create that nest like this. And she uses her, her neck and breast to press against this side of the nest while she's pushing with her feet against that side of the nest. And that's how she creates that beautiful symmetrical mud wall. So that's a robin's nest. Now I told you about a nest that could be made with horsehair, and that was that warbling, warbling vireo. Well, this is a horsehair nest, and you can see how they've woven the horsehair into this beautiful little tiny sphere. This nest blew down in the middle of a storm in February. It's the previous year's nest. And my friends who collected it for me, and Mass Audubon has a special permit that allows it to collect these nests. Nobody else is sort of allowed to do that without that permit. They're, they live next to a horse farm. And so they had plenty of horsetail <laughs> hair. And that's what went into that nest. And here is my favorite nest, as I have told you before. Remember that Baltimore Oriole? Well, this is the feather from a Baltimore Oriole. It's quite an amazing piece of color. And this is the nest that blew down from a end of a tree in late April in a cemetery. And you can see that the bird has used ribbons from flowers to create the, the weaving that it's done. And it has a beautiful entrance. I don't know whether you can see that there. Robert, nod at me if you can see the entrance. OK, thanks. Uh, nice little entrance there. Mama goes in there. And it would be hanging this way on the branch. Now, you may have thought to yourself, how could a raccoon fight off a fox? Well, I'm going to show you. And you're not going to be happy with what you see. <laughs> this is a raccoon skull. Look at those teeth. And you can see my hand. This is my hand underneath it. This is a big animal. And it's got some really serious looking teeth, as, as does a fox. So it, it can do some, some serious damage. OK, would you want to try to take any questions now? or? Absolutely. Let me pause the recording. Okay.